We have a chef, we have a writer, we have an entrepreneur, podcast host, artist, so many things. Uh, chef Jenny Dorsey, help me welcome her. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Thank you all for so being much. here. Um, let's just start at the beginning. Can you just tell us a little bit about your background and uh, I guess how, how your story starts? Yeah, so um, I started my career, uh, speak up, okay. Can you hear me okay? Back. Um, so I started my career in New York. Um, I used to be in management consulting and uh, ended up changing careers. Long story short, um, went into management consulting as a luxury and fashion goods analyst. Worked really hard to get into that group and it was like a weird realization when you've worked so hard to get into a place that you've kind of dreamt up in your head as something else. Um, you thought that you're going to be happy there, you're going to feel really fulfilled, it's going to be super glamorous, you're going to put it on your LinkedIn profile and feel good about yourself. And uh, you get there and you're like, wow, this job sucks. And also you look at the partners of the company and that is not the life um, that you want. And I was you know, 20, 21, and I just didn't really know what to do with this information. So I essentially just tried to dodge the information by, well, kind of a shirking work a little bit and then applying to graduate school. Um, so I got an early decision at Columbia Business School, I essentially thought of it as like, oh, two years, I could get a break, figure out what I want to do with my life. Um, and I had a short break between leaving my job and starting at Columbia, where I decided to go to culinary school. Um, didn't really think that it would be a career per se, just knew that food and cooking had always been the thing that I wanted to do. And once I finished culinary school, I just couldn't, like I still went to Columbia for a semester and then ended up leaving because it just, it, you can feel in your heart it wasn't the right thing. And you can, I could feel like I was again falling back into the trap of keeping up with the Joneses, wanting to make the money that my colleagues were making, um, try to like find fulfillment and success in all the wrong things in life. Yeah. And it was really like, I knew that if I step, like kept putting myself in that environment, I would end up going back and falling back into the person that I didn't want to be. So end up taking a big pivot, leaving school um, and trying to figure out what uh, to do in food. So have done the gamut of things over the last few years. I've done everything from being a barista to selling juice door to door. I have a funny story about um, selling juice to some of the biggest VCs in Silicon Valley. Like I was like, oh, do you want green juice for your next week? And at the same time, my husband works working in startups, like trying to get in front of their offices. And I'd be like, oh yeah, I went there today telling them all the benefits of, you know, nut milk. So, um, <laughs> so done um, a bunch of strange things, worked in different restaurants, um, did the gambit of like PR, just styling, all sorts of things to see what I like to do and have sort of pieced together, at least I feel like I'm in the middle of piecing together a career in food that's a little different, but ultimately fulfilling and interesting. How integral was, was cooking in your childhood? Yeah, so cooking, I think, I think for a lot of um, immigrant children, you know, food is a way that you have, like, maintain that connection with your family. Yeah. Um, maybe there's, like, a little bit of a language barrier. There's definitely a generational gap. But cooking is kind of something that everyone can sort of agree on. Yeah. So similar to that, um, I grew up cooking with my, ma my mom and my grandmother. And I think back in the day, there was more, there was some, like, oh, I don't want to cook or I, whatever, this is this is boring. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, wait a minute, I don't remember what we used to do. I can't remember these herbs that my grandma used to grow. I don't even know how to grow them. And um, you realize that you're also trying to hold on to something. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think a lot of people are kind of grappling with that. Like, how do you deal with some maybe losing people of the past um, and finding an identity in something that you might have pushed away before, especially mm -hmm as a, like a, I'm a first generation, but even second generation, third generation immigrants, trying to figure out you know, where, where you fall in that spectrum. You at any point, especially when you were talking about that, at any point did you kind of reject the food of your culture to kind of assimilate to the, the culture uh, around you? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the dishes that I made last year talked about that concept of you know, the lunchbox moment where you go to school and you have your 
whatever it is, and people are like, oh, gross. And you feel this shame of like, my food is disgusting. I'm disgusting. Nobody, nobody accepts me. And I vividly recall um, there was a few weeks where I would be hungry because I would just throw out my food. Mm. Or, and then there was a few weeks after that where I didn't want to be hungry anymore, so I would go eat in the bathroom, um, like mean girl style, mm. you know? And so I definitely just remember like how to, like, so many years I kind of pushed those memories away didn't want to deal with it mm -hmm. and recently just as a chef and um, as someone who's working in art and wants to be uh, using food as a, a form of activism being able to surface those things through food mm -hmm. and so the the course that I made about that it's served in a metal lunchbox and it's served to all the guests clothes and when you open it there's a little name tag and it's like those hello my name is name tags and when you open it the only thing it says is like it's like hello my name is and it just says disgusting and it's all these ingredients that used to be considered very disgusting um, but are now gentrified or fancy or even expensive and glamorous like oysters used to be really considered a poor man's food mm -hmm. so just kind of dealing with that I think through art has been very helpful for me yeah. um, to figure out how I was feeling and sometimes be able to talk about it more openly with my family. Hmm. Can you uh, describe a little bit about your your culinary school experience? Sure. Yeah, just because you kind of went bounced from job to job and then you kind of decided to dive into culinary school. How was that experience for you? Culinary school, so I'm sure some people here have gone, some people haven't, and hmm. there's a uh, mixed opinions on definitely the investment opportunity that culinary school presents. Um, so happy to talk about that in detail yeah. later. But I think culinary school ultimately was helpful for me because I just needed a place where I could put my corporate persona behind me and be a new person. That was the biggest help it was. I don't think culinary school really sets you up. I guess I went to ICE um, here in New York City uh, before they moved down to their fancy new location. So I think like technique wise, because you're there for such a short period of time, mm -hmm. I don't know if it like really prepares you to like go work on the line immediately. But I mean, definitely not work on the line immediately. Like maybe you can go do garde manger or something. But I think the biggest help I think in culinary school is just having some time to go home and read. Go uh, have mm -hmm. some time to ask the questions when people are not trying to also do service at the same time. Ask how actually how things work. Um, and so that was helpful intellectually for me, but also just mentally as a person, I found a different crew to be around in culinary school. Yeah. Um, for a long time, I had surrounded myself with people who saw success in the same way as I did, which was always about getting ahead, getting a promotion, making more money, all of that stuff, which is, of course, important. But um, in culinary school, because I was going to an evening program after work, I was with people who were also career changers, people who were older, people who had kids, and they were trying to change their life. Mm -hmm. And they just had a different perspective. It's not always about getting ahead. It's like also how you get there. I know that sounds really cliche, but I, mm. I never saw it that way. Yeah, it's about um, the art. Yeah, yeah. And, it was, and I feel like I made real friends who believed in me, who saw me as more than something that I could represent on my Facebook profile. Mm -hmm. It was like, we really love you for all your flaws and your weirdness and all of that stuff. And I just didn't feel like I, I understood that you could even have that sort of relationship with people yeah. before. So I think ultimately, like, I have very fond memories of culinary school classmates. Um, I'm still working through how I feel about culinary school teachers. We definitely had, let's say, some <laughs> unconscious bias in terms of which cuisines reign supreme yeah. um, in culinary yeah. school. So I think that's something m many culinary schools are trying to address right now. Yeah, I think uh, especially some of the, the larger ones, I think one cuisine reigns supreme. <laughs> yes. uh, there's not necessarily a, a full em uh, embrace of all cuisines. Sure. I know? mean, we left out certain continents in culinary school. Yeah, yeah. like I went, to, I went to Johnson & Wales, and we had two weeks that was called international cuisine, <laughs> yeah. which was two weeks to address all cuisine of the entire world that was not French. Yep. And it was, uh, it was a very... It's a very interesting class. We watched a lot of movies. That's, yeah. that's what I remember. Oh, you guys watch movies? We watched a lot of movies about... We didn't actually do a lot of cooking. We watched... <laughs> yeah, we would watch, like... Uh, we watched uh, Amelie. I was just like, I don't quite understand why <laughs> I'm paying you to watch this movie. But um, moving out of kind of the... Co it, was, it was weird. It was weird. Like, why am I watching this movie in school? Um, moving out of that, 
once you got out of culinary school, kind of where did you, where did you land after that? Yeah, um, so I did my externship at Market Table. Um, if you guys haven't been, it's in West Village. It's kind of like upscale New American. Um, and then the, what was really great about Market Table was that I think I was not ready to be in like a fine dining environment. I just, for lack of a better word, needed to be coddled a little bit more. Like I was not ready for the hours, not ready for that kind of stress level. Because mm -hmm. um, after Market Table, my chef was like, pulled me aside. He's like, I think you did a good job in your externship. I think you really need to think about your time management because you're just like taking like too long to do things. Um, I think like, you know, he was, he was also a career changer. So he was very much like a great mentor and advisor. He went on to be the executive chef at Cafe Clover and then he left recently. But anyway, so like he also knew, knew like that I wasn't meant to just be in the kitchen perhaps and maybe wanted to do other things. But he's like, wait, when you're here, you need to be faster. Mm. I don't know how to say it better to you. Um, so after that, I went to SPQR, I moved to San Francisco and I was like, oh, I see what he was saying. Cause I was, I just, or at least I felt like the slowest, dumbest person in the kitchen. I was like, always mm. like, I just always felt like my body was like in the wrong shape. Um, and so I learned a lot from that experience, like an incredible, just like an incredible restaurant. Um, and then had the opportunity to come back here and work at Atera um, on a scholarship from the Bacusta Or. So that was, mm. that, I think Atera really rounded out and kind of finalized a lot of how I felt about like how a fine dining restaurant should run and how people should be treated in one. Um, really mm. loved the management at Atera. We had a great chef, exec chef Ronnie Emborg, who's still there, and our CDC Elena, who has since left, but was such a, like, a strong female presence in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, our pastry chef, um, Mallory, who's now the exec Sue at Sunday in Brooklyn, um, also a really strong female presence. So it was just, I realized how important it was for me to have like a good representation of male, female in the kitchen, A, mm. but also just like how people work together because it was such a small restaurant and it was an open kitchen and we, we the chefs also cooked and served and had to work with front of house yeah. in a closer way, like made me realize there's, there's plenty of issues at Atera as well in terms of how people are getting paid and healthcare and all of that. But at least for our baseline, um, it may uh, really help me think through like how I, I would hopefully want to treat my staff one day. It's interesting because you, you said the chef said he saw something that you were, you were, you were going looking to do something. The chef said that you were kind of looking to, you were going to get into something else outside of cooking. Did you kind of have that idea in your head before the chef said that to you? Yeah, I was always, and I think I still am, I'm trying to figure out how to balance the tactical enjoyment of cooking uh -huh. with other things that I like to do, whether it's writing, um, whether it's like creating art in a more abstract sense. And mm -hmm. also um, I've been doing a lot of ev immersive events for the last few years. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what does that mean? And what parts of that do I actually enjoy or not enjoy? Mm -hmm. um, so I think at some point I figured out like, where does cooking stop being enjoyable? Um, and I learned okay. that I'm, I'm not meant for like high volumes. I don't really like that kind of cooking. I also, working at, at fine dining where there's like, there's a cutoff where I'm like, this is so much work for one little thing. And some people really enjoy that, but there's so much waste. There's so much like excess time. There's a huge reliance on unpaid labor. And I'm not, I don't want to be behind that. Um, so I think it was just, who knows what he meant. But I think for me, it was like finding my boundaries of where, where I want it to be. Hmm. Uh, kind of leaping off that, at what point did you kind of walk away from the restaurant life and decide, I'm going to kind of jump into my own thing? Yeah. Um, after I worked at Atera, that was um, the beginning of 2016. Yeah. Um, I had been doing like some freelance consulting um, during that time yeah. just to make ends meet and decided that I wanted to spend a little bit more time actually investing in my own business and mm -hmm. seeing what consulting, I guess, people were like, restaurant consulting, I'd done a little bit of that, but I wanted to see if I could do it by myself. Mm -hmm. um, long story short on that is, yeah, it was great. Had a good restaurant consulting business or like freelance. I did some writing, did some recipe development, all that. Mm -hmm. And also realized at some point, like that is also not enjoyable. So it, like, I, I feel it's been this constant, like oh, every two years, just having a midlife crisis. The quest continues. The quest continues oh, of um, what do I like about this and what do I not like about this? Uh -huh. um, when I was doing more consulting, um, I was helping open like some fast casual places as well as 
quick service places and doing some recipe development for magazines and stuff. And a lot of times it became just super repetitive. Mm -hmm. um, you deal with kind of the same problems and you always end up with the same problems or yeah. people don't listen to you because they're not super invested. And ultimately not being an owner in that business, you can just kind of hope that people listen to your advice, but they, they don't have to. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And sometimes they are paying you to be the scapegoat as well. So like they're it, paying you to be the bad guy? Right. Mm. Or, you know, you can tell them, I don't think this kitchen's going to open in two months. And they're like, we don't care. Um, sure, sure. So, mm. it, so it, was, it was like really difficult kind of balancing. Like I wanted to really put myself into, I want to make you succeed. And that wasn't really working out. So mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to pivot from there and find, like kind of find that joy again. I feel that's the, that's a continual quest. Like the continuous at, look for joy. Yeah. Quest for joy. Like I think learning, I find innate enjoyment in learning. And then yeah. after you stop learning, then it just becomes doing. And mm. then there's no, in, I think there's not a lot of enjoyment for me in just doing the same thing over and over again. I guess speaking about the continuous quest for joy, um, have you found that in kind of doing your own exhibitions, <laughs> kind of having your own unique voice put out there in an unfiltered way? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, and but it's like it's a it's a never ending cycle. So the main thing I have been working on for the last um, eight, nine months um, is something called Asian America. It's a immersive ex exhibition and dining experience. So it's six courses of food that's paired with poetry, spoken word, and virtual reality. And we've been touring that across the US. And so that's been very exciting because it's like vulnerable, it's scary, it's been able to uh, connect me with my um, Asian American heritage mm -hmm. and also connect with the bigger community, which has been interesting in both cities like New York. We just were in Los Angeles with the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival. So mm -hmm. kind of getting the vibe of the community out there is Int always interesting um, but that being said like nine months in cooking the same menu for all these different people getting yeah. getting more corporate stuff requests which is always good because um, this is all run through my nonprofit so nonprofits need money like any other business but there's a little bit of that like joy doing breakdown yeah. that's starting to happen yeah. so I'm trying to be more strategic of instead of every event you know barely making money making a little bit of money it's like mm -hmm. okay well, how do I pivot to another project? We're launching a new project next month. That's a, a piece called Hidden. It's about cognitive dissonance, and it's, um, it uses food, dance, and virtual reality. So there's like dancers in the room, so it's performance art as well. So like getting excited about a new project while still kind of keeping like the old one on the back burner so that we can hmm. kind of have it as a series. Yeah. Um, but maybe having a little distance so I can feel excited about it again. Hmm. Can you uh, kind of explain a little bit more about the Asian America exhibits? Because just from, from what I've seen, all of your, your dishes have kind of a very unique theme to it. Sure. The whole thing has a very unique theme to it. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so it's six courses of food. And every course talks about a different topic within kind of the Asian American narrative identity. Um, one of the courses talks about the model minority myth. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's kind of the myth that like Asian Americans are doing great, so they don't need any more help. Um, if you've been following the lawsuit against Harvard recently, it's kind of that, oh, well, we actually shouldn't, should be, like Asian Americans claim that they were getting discriminated against because they were getting into Harvard by the droves. Mm. Is that true? It's, it's a long story, but now, now we're looking at if affirmative action is going to stand or not, but different story. So anyway, so one, one talks about the model minority myth and draws parallels um, with that to the food itself. So the main protein on that dish um, is veal sweetbread. So I talk about how veal sweetbreads, um, many times offals are seen as really disgusting, but in particular instances, especially for particular things like sweetbreads, mm -hmm. when they're deep fried and they're served with a sauce, all of a sudden you can charge a lot of money for them. And it's that kind of, that weird like, well, if I mold myself into a certain way, if I'm seen a certain way, then I'm doing great. When actually as a category, mm -hmm. there's tons of disparity in terms of Asian Americans, who's doing well, who's not. There's tons of disparity in the communities. And I think that's true for any minority community, you know? Yeah. Um, so being able to examine that through food, if, the, if you see a picture of the plate, the plate itself is actually piped out like a maze. Um, sometimes, depending on how my sous chef feels, the maze is closed off and sometimes the maze is open, but it's, it's kind of uh, like symbolic of like navigating that through, um, through your life and 
feeling like you're always kind of stuck in a little bit of a circle. Hmm. Um, one of the courses talks about substitutions and how so many times, especially for cuisines that have long been seen as less important, it's easy to substitute certain things. Hmm. I don't know who, if other people have had this experience in culinary school, but many times like, oh, you don't have random ingredient for Chinese food, substitute it with something else. Mm. But you would never do that for like the French course because it's like you don't have time. You can't just like throw marjoram in there. It's not the same thing. Mm, yeah. But many, it's really about like perception of what is substitutable. And so, um, and it, I think kind of drawing parallels of like all, all Asian Americans look the same, right? Mm. Or like there's a, there's a little bit of how we see food is also how we see the people of that culture. Mm. So anyway, for that particular dish, I've taken all of these things from different Asian American or Asian foods and just substituted so much out of it that it is completely wrong. Yeah. And the, by, it's the first course that comes out. And my favorite reaction is everyone reads the name card and the postcard, which describes the menu item. So one of them is like chawan mushi. But um, instead of actually making a chawan mushi, which is a Japanese like egg custard, um, I mix it together. I mix the base together. There's still dashi in there. But I add a bunch of brie and gruyere. And then I pump it in the ISI foam so it comes out as a foam. Mm. And people are like, what is this? Because it's not chawan mushi. It's all, like, for lack of a better term, it's totally fucked up. And, it's, and people are... Like, oh, you know, that's how, like, and I think a lot of us internalize that as like, oh, well, parts of me is substitutable. So um, every course talks about something different. One of them talks about stereotypes, stereotypes that we see both from other people, but also stereotypes that we put upon our own cultures. Mm -hmm. I'm Chinese American, and I'm 100% guilty of also complaining that Chinese restaurant, that new millennial Chinese restaurant is too expensive, right? And it, that's mm -hmm. a perception that Chinese restaurants are co constantly trying to fight, that we're also worth being, we're not just a cheap eat. Um, so mm -hmm. talking about like that breakdown of stereotypes between us and the other, um, one of them talks about saviors, the white male savior complex of we need a white male to come in and <laughs> save our food or make it popular or make it known to the world stage. Um, and one of them talks about uh, being fancy just because French techniques are being used. I find this whole thing entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> Some people, I think it's funny because the point is that it's not a comfortable conversation and everybody reacts to being uncomfortable differently. Yeah. So some people lean into it yeah. and some people find enjoyment or, you know, I think life is funny. Uh, it, oh, you, ha yeah. you have to find humor in it. And some people are super turned off and that's fine too. They don't have to come again. Yeah. <laughs> I just have a weird laugh when I get uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do yeah. one of those. Yeah. Speaking of, speaking of that, I kind of do want to talk, because you, you did speak about, about I guess, um, Chinese restaurants or the perception of Chinese restaurants in America. And there's been kind of a, a new trend of, I guess I'll say, non-Asian people opening Chinese restaurants sure. that are kind of based on these old kind of stereotypical tropes, right? Like they're all named Lucky. Lucky. Yeah, right? <laughs> like why are they all named Lucky for? <laughs> yeah. Or... Um, and they have like that one font, you know, like the... Yeah, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the font you see on the takeout box. Yeah, yeah. like, like, um, or they, and then they kind of propose, oh, well, you know, we're, we're doing Chinese food, or we're doing it, we're doing it so much cleaner. We're doing it uh, so much better than, but there's kind of, you're kind of playing against this, this old American perception because when the food came over, Americans didn't want to eat it, so they, they made it a certain way so Americans could eat because they, these people have to live, they have to make a living. And then, and now, then we're kind of in a place now where it, it seems like people are like, oh, I want it healthier. Well, it was kind of healthy to start with, but you kind of want it a different way. Yeah. Um, I guess, can you kind of speak, speak about what, where is the line between them, cultural appropriation, and then, I guess, cultural appreciation? Yeah. Where, where is that line? Where so many people are, especially in New York City, so many people are kind of, um, introduced to so many different cuisines and people like different things, but they're not necessarily kind of educated about the actual culture behind the cuisine. Yep. Yes, where, where, is the, where is that line? I think I've been having this conversation a lot on podcasts with other chefs. I think inherently, you know, baseline is that there's nothing wrong with anyone cooking the food of a different culture. Mm. And if anything, one of the great things about food is that you absorb a lot from different cultures. And mm. naturally, that is kind of the point of 
food and cooking, but at the same time, especially if you're going to coin yourself as cooking specifically the food of Chinese cuisine or Northern Thailand or Mexican or whatever, it's like being able to actually give back to the, that community so that you're not just profiting from it. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the distinction between the two mm -hmm. is that fantastic. You Something about Japanese cuisine really appeals to you. Awesome. Cook it, make it well known, but also how do you give back in some way, whether it's through better education of that region's food and their mm -hmm. culture, better education and appreciation for those people. I think like make, um, separating the two is where you have issues. Yeah. You can't just yeah. purely benefit off of making Chinese food, but then kind of using with your marketing campaign kind of diss Chinese people at the same time, because mm -hmm. those things inherently are, you know, countering each other. Um, and I think in the, many of the cases that we've seen recently, it's a lack of diversity. If she had one person of color on her marketing team, could yeah. have told her that was not going to fly. So it, I think at this, especially at this point, people are realizing that there, yes, like some people call it the PC culture, but I think like we're just transitioning into a stage where we're more conscious of people, other people's feelings, especially those who have been held down for so long mm -hmm. and who have been told that they're other, that they're not they're less than who are kind of like figuring out their voice. And sometimes maybe that comes out in an aggressive way. Sometimes that comes out in a less aggressive way or it maybe it doesn't come out perfectly, but mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to get there. And yeah. so this is a time to listen and to and understand like, does this make you feel more othered? I don't think that Chinese people at least as, as Chinese and American, as a Chinese American myself, I don't think I would have been offended by Lucky Cricket mm -hmm. or um, no, sorry, Lucky Lee's, Lucky Cricket, isn't it? Lucky Lee's. If she had come out being like, I want to make like a a, a gluten free, vegan, natural, whatever Chinese food. It's like, oh, it's another fast casual concept. Mm. Do I want to eat there? Maybe not. That's not for me. And maybe I just want to go eat, you know, like Hunan Chinese cuisine, which is already pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. But like, whatever. She's a lot, she can do whatever she wants and there'll be an audience for that. Mm -hmm. But what she can still help Chinese cuisine by getting people into her store and educating them about it without making them feel bad. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting because she did. Well, I guess when she was marketing it, she came out a little sideways because it, it sounded a little bit like, well, this food, I'm, I'm going to take this cuisine and I'm going to take this culture and I'm going to make it better. Right. It's like a savior thing. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of how it was. And I guess speaking about that, what do you think, particularly as someone that is involved as a chef and you're involved in media as well, what do you think about the, the current state of, of representation and how, um, I guess how, I guess I'll, I'll call it ethnic food, it's probably not the right term, but how, how it's being, I guess, critiqued or viewed in the media as someone that, that's part of the media? I think that it's changing, um, but the reality is is that whenever I feel, so as a writer, you know, I'm friends with all the other people who are right, trying to be more cognizant of um, culture within food. Um, so I'm really happy that, you know, if, if anyone here follows like Soleil Ho, she's the new mm -hmm. SF Chronicle writer and that's huge. She's a woman of color. She's also a former chef and she has, you know, publicly been out there saying that she doesn't know about Burmese food and that she's like also digs into like cultural implications of this and that, et cetera. So anyway, um, I follow her and I'm like, yeah, look at all these things that are changing. Look how great we are. Look how far we've come. And then I'll go work for a client. I won't name who, but they're all like, <laughs> you know, like healthy vegan lifestyle. And, and literally while I was working for this client, they asked me like, I don't understand what the problem with Lucky Lee's was. She wasn't trying to harm anyone. And so I can see there is a huge disconnect in the, like there's, it's, it's a little bit of an echo chamber. The people who are in it are in it and they're like, yeah. And the people who are not are like, this is stupid. And so I'm not sure how to bridge that gap. Yeah. I think, I think we're trying to, and there's fights on f social media about it all the time. Um, but I think ultimately there's a lot just in the way, um, the media landscape in terms of like who's making money is changing. Mm -hmm. Um, it comes down to like what what articles are making money and so unfortunately there's a lot of like paid content there's a lot of content that perhaps is not written particularly with high journalistic integrity mm, because baby. they're just right because mm. they're just pushing out content that leads to clicks and seo says that this sort of headline that that's more inflammatory that's more negligent 
ultimately gets better reviews mm -hmm. and ultimately drives more money and traffic to that site. So I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I think that, yeah. It's, it's interesting, the, the point that you brought up, because I, I think about the Burberries of the world. I think about mm -hmm. all, these, all these, these companies that made really tragic business moves, like, um, like the, the sweater with the tassel that looked like nooses, yeah. the black face the shoes. Thing, yeah. yeah, and I'm just like, this is kind of, it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a scenario where the, the case for diversity makes itself, where if there was perhaps a person of color or a, a, a like-minded person, in that room, they would have said, uh, hey guys, the, the sweater with the nooses, it's not gonna work out. Hey guys, the, uh, the hat with the, with the black face, we need to rethink this. Maybe we should go back to the board on this one. Yeah. Um, I, I guess when I say that, do you feel an obligation as, I guess, a person of color who is writing to say, I, I, need, to, I need to be part of educating people who are not as knowledgeable? Yes even if they're well-intentioned? Yes, and I think that um, I also want to throw out the Big for, the Big for Women. Yeah. Like, if anybody remembers that, there was like Pink Big Pens, women. Big for Women that came out a few years ago. And it's like, if there had been one woman in that room, wouldn't have she have said, I don't want pink pens marketed Wait, towards me? There are pens for women? Yes. Pens are pens. Pe pens, yeah. Like, it's big <laughs> for women. It's literally, it's like a little bit more expensive than they were pink. I mean, you oh know. Oh, my gosh. But, uh, <laughs> but I think, yes, I think one of the biggest things that I, as a writer, I feel responsible for is admitting when I don't know something or when I'm not an expert and mm. that I am talking from my point of view. Because so many yeah. times, you know, as the writer, you are something someone's entry into perhaps a different culture, a different food, different types of people. Mm -hmm. And like you are, unless you feel you are, but you're usually not like the end all be all expert on all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so you admitting that also helps people realize that you're only like a small drop in the pie. There's so many much more, there's so much more nuance to that than you can express in one article. Mm -hmm. Not nobody can, nobody and no culture can be kind of dumbed down into, you know, a ma man manageable slices. Yeah. Um, I just started writing a column for Serious Eats about soups around the world. Mm -hmm. And so the first soup that I'm highlighting um, is Khao Pak San, which is a Lao soup. And I don't know anything about Lao food or culture, so obviously interviewed a lot of people, but also have been writing a little of like, you know, this is my understanding of what happened with this soup. Um, what's interesting is that Lao food influenced a lot of Thailand and Vietnam, and especially in Thailand, there's actually, in Northern Thailand, um, there's more Lao people living there, ethnically Lao people living there, mm. than in Laos, which is a relatively small country. Mm. Um, but in the 1940s, after there was a coup, a coup, sorry, um, in Thailand, a military coup in Thailand, they did this huge like nationalization campaign, and they stopped calling anything Lao. And they wouldn't recognize, they basically erased Lao from their history. Mm. And so the, now there's this like interesting thing where you many times go to Thai restaurants here, and you'll sometimes see Lao dishes because they're ethnic, ethnically Lao, mm. but they, it's no, you know, it's not yeah, something you talk yeah. about. So trying to unravel just the beginnings of that in this column, but saying like, I don't know everything you know yeah. please go out and do your own research like here here's a taste um and i'm also not kind of like like my opinion is not the only opinion mm. so anyway just being able to set the stage for that i think is really important while still yeah. being able to you know give people the voice like i shouldn't be the voice for lao food like chef sang who runs with this amazing lao restaurant mm -hmm. in dc should be and uh i just want to say you know if you want to join the conversation uh there will be opportunity for our audience to ask the chef questions as well, but I do want to kind of ask this question before we get to the audience, because I was reading, I'm reading all your essays. Oh, thank you. Very enjoyable. But uh, you did have one quote, and I do want to kind of dig a little deeper into that. You said, you know, failure is not a loss of power, but a reminder that only you have the power to control how it shapes you. How exactly do you use failure as a means to empower yourself? Um, I failed so many times um, <laughs> in my life. And I, I think my, I actually have a, a really favorite, one of my favorite, um, like, not quotes, but just things that I read about failure from a friend of mine who runs Ovenly, which is like a bakery here, a woman-owned bakery here. 
and she says so many failure stories and in some sort of like success story like mm -hmm. I failed but then I did this and I'm totally guilty of that as well I've written some failure essays that ended in a success story and she went on to talk about just like a pure failure she hired someone put them in a role she thought they would be good at they, she didn't support them. They ended up quitting. She yelled at them for quitting. Now they're like, well, it was one of her best employees. Now they're no, no longer friends at all. Mm. And it was just a complete and utter failure. Mm. Um, and it just got me thinking of like, yes, like that's so right to be able to acknowledge that and say like, I completely messed this one up. Mm -hmm. How do I get better? This, that one doesn't necessarily have a happy ending, but failure is like not the end. It's mm. always just... I, I like to think it's it's the beginning of something else. If you can, if you're able to look at that failure in the eye and say, "This is all the things I did wrong," and yeah. I own up to it, then you can do better next time. Versus if you just kind of like avoid it, don't want to talk about it, defend yourself, get defensive, which is what I usually do as well. Um, <laughs> you never get better. Um, yeah. So I just try to think like, if I can be kind and accept myself, I think that's. As immigrant children, I think a lot of us have, might have that issue as well. Yeah. If you accept yourself as innately worthy, you can fail as many times as you want, but still be able to continue onwards. Yeah, you can fail and still have value. Exactly. Mm. Well, does anybody in our audience have a question for Chef that they would like to ask her? Yeah, please. Um, could you talk a little bit about your use of virtual reality? Oh, yes, of course. Um, so specifically for Asian America, which I've been um, roving around. So there are six courses of food, and three of them are paired with VR. So in the virtual reality, um, you see a brushstroke by brushstroke recreation of the dish that the guest is about to eat. Um, alongside audio narration from me explaining each of the techniques and the symbolism behind the techniques. So it's made in a platform called Tilt Brush. Um, it's uh, you're watching it in an Oculus Go, which is like an untethered headset. The, the short term being is like you can watch it and it unfolds in 360 space. But if you watch it with one of those like fancy tethered headsets where it's like hooked up to a computer, you could actually walk through the painting, like get behind something, uh, which is interesting. But anyway, people watch it unfold. So it's like, let's say one of the dishes has um, a marinated quail egg. So you see like the quail egg being drawn, you see it like coming into the marinade, you see it coming out of the marinade. And because she did it in order, so the artist I work with is amazing. She did everything like in order in sequence. So she couldn't stop and start. She had to like do the whole thing. I think she was in um, VR drawing one day for like six hours. I was like, you're amazing. Um, so you see it like go from step one to the finished product. So at the very end you like turn um, and you see like a finished composed dish of what you're about to eat, you understand like this is what the maize means or this is what the veal sweetbreads mean. This is why I put seltus in that dish. Seltus, if people, I don't know if you guys have it on the menu, but it's an interesting Chinese, mostly Chinese vegetable, also used in other um, Asian cultures. And it's been used a long time, obviously. And Dan Barber, a few years ago, said he like, he claimed it for himself, and so the, there was like some <laughs> ironies there. But anyway, um, so why each of those ingredients were, <laughs> why each of those ingredients were um, prepared for that dish, and when they take off the headset, the dish is in front of them. All right. Uh, anybody else? Yes. Um, we talk a lot about seeing ourselves in places we want to go work, we want to work with. You mentioned female chefs and representation, and a little about Asian chefs. So, how important has having that representation been for you? in everything from management consulting, because I feel like you've touched on it everywhere, but mm -hmm. not really directly talked about that. I think um, just being able to, I think like when I think back to all some of the mistakes or some of the shortcomings that I had in my career, it was a lot of times like I feel like I was trying to fit into someone else's mold because there was no one a no one that I could really look up to, whether it was a female, was an Asian female, or just any like female of color who I could like really talk to or maybe even call me out on some bad behavior. I mean, there was many, definitely times when I was a management consultant when I was just like a cutthroat asshole. And I really wish someone had been like, you don't have to be one of the guys to get ahead. Like, but there was no one there. Um, so I think it's really important as women, as more minorities, like start moving up the ranks that they are looking, like they're helping the, you know, the next generation come up and be like, you are worth who you like you're a value you are you should be able to be yourself and not have to like conform and like let your true color shine that sound kind of cliche but like how like how to nurture that sort of creativity and nurture that sort of like self-worth um yeah I think that's like 
the biggest, most important part of representation. Uh, I guess I will. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, please. That's a good question. I mean, I don't know. I don't necessarily need people to remember like who I am or what I did or any specifics about that. I think about, so I, I swear this is related. I, I talked to someone recently who went down to eat at Noma um, when they were in Mexico. And he doesn't quite remember what he ate, but he said he ate a dish of fruit. I think it was fruit. And it like changed his perspective on like what he should be eating because he was like a big carnivore. And then now he's He's not vegetarian, but he's just like suddenly had this like appreciation for all these other things. And um, I just hope that after everything is, I've done everything I can do, that people maybe don't remember my name or like the exact event or what they ate, but they'll remember like after that, I really changed the, my perspective on other people. Perhaps I did some introspection that I like thought of myself differently. Like one of those three things would be awesome. And I think like as an artist, I mean, how many times do you go to the, un, you know, the Whitney and how, like, what's your, realistically, your hit rate for every single painting? You know, that person who painted the thing or sculpted the thing, that's in incredibly meaningful to them, but maybe 10% of people walk away with that sort of feeling. So I just hope that I can, I can like match up to like that, those 10%, I made a difference and that's good enough. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think the biggest thing, and I think uh, many chefs are talking about this and noticing now, is like if you're not in an environment where you feel like you're, you can succeed, if people are not supporting you and they're not treating you right, then the best thing that you can do for yourself is to just get out as soon as possible. Um, I've done that in less than stellar fashions. There was a time I was supposed to start a project. It's a long story, but literally like quit the day before I was supposed to start and let me like definitely burn some bridges so not the best way to do that but like it was a terrible working environment and I had to get out and I think so many people especially in the food and restaurant industry were taught that like you should be yelled at you should have these years where basically you're getting harassed um, or you should be treated a certain way you, you need to be tough but like being tough doesn't mean that you have to be an asshole and being tough doesn't mean you have to like not have any self-care not take care of yourself for years gain tons of weight and feel like awful about yourself you know like I think being able to instill more of a self-worth and like tell the younger generation of chefs who are figuring out who they still are that they are worthwhile their time and their energy and their dedication is all worth it so if someone's not treating you right then they don't deserve to have that they don't deserve your talent um, and making people feel more confident that they can walk away so that we can they can go and put their efforts somewhere else. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite food memory? Favorite food memory? Ooh, um, I would say there was one time where um, like my family always has like these potlucks for, I don't know, for no real reason. <laughs> they just have potlucks um, with all the other uh, like moms and families of the area. And all the moms have this kind of it's like, um, what, is, what is that show with the housewives? Not real housewives, like Desperate Housewives, where they all have like kind of like passive aggressive, like mm -hmm. they say passive aggressive things to each other. Well, all the moms in our group would like all make the same dish and kind of be like, mine's the best. Oh, yours is pretty good too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that was kind of this weird undercurrent. But the happy story is like, all, everyone like voted that my mom's particular dish that day was the best and I helped her make it and that was like one of the first times I really cooked with her in the kitchen and so she was like so pleased with herself and my mom and I don't have the best relationship but that was like one good memory out of all of that realizing like you know food can bring 
food can bring like an interesting emotional connection that I hadn't noticed before. Um, I think it changes a lot. Um, recently, I've been uh, making, there's one dish on the Asian American menu. It's like uh, black sesame and dark rye pasta with like a habanero chutney that I learned when I was down in Haiti opening up an ice cream shop for a nonprofit. A whole interesting, weird story there. But that's like one of my favorite things to eat. And it's kind of a pain to cook, but like sometimes on the weekend, splurge meal, I'll do it. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, something I'm really working on, and I think, so recently I got back from Los Angeles, like totally packed my schedule way too tight, and like had this kind of realization like I was not doing any of that. I wasn't recharging. My mouth had actually broken out in completely in hives. Like I had cold sores, I had like canker sores, like I like couldn't eat for like a day and a half because like everything I put in my mouth hurt. Um, and I was like, this is my body telling me there's something wrong with how I operate my life basically. Um, and so I've been actively trying to work on that. And I think for me, the biggest learning is, and sometimes I get like this weird sense of satisfaction, is like being able to say no to things. Um, I like want to say yes to everything. I want to, I'm definitely like a yes, like a people pleaser. I want everyone to be happy. Um, I had a really hard time when I was in fact doing my own consulting thing, like charging higher rates because I, I, people were like, can you come down to half of what you want to charge? And I'd be like, okay, you know, so I, like, that took a long time. And so now getting opportunities, some better pay than others for um, the nonprofit, it's been really hard to say no. Um, so I'm still getting there, but I think one of the most helpful things I do for, to recharge is like, I always say like on Saturdays, I'll nothing before like 10 a.m. And then just try and vet things with my husband because honestly, he's way better at saying like, "What? This is a waste of your time." Because not, I never think anything is a waste of my time. But he's like, "No, this is like, what is this really doing for you? And is it worth the amount of energy and time? Everything always takes twice as long as you really think it's going to take. And even if it doesn't take that long, like yesterday, I was like randomly making waffles for a client at like 10 o'clock at night, and I'm not really sure that was the best use of my time." You know, but mm. I can't see that until someone says it. So being able to, I guess, have more, give vetting veto power to other people in my life has been helpful. Uh, anybody else? Well, thank you so much. Thank Help you. me thank our guest, Jenny Dorsey, for our conversation today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.